Two men ride on horseback across the country and stop some distance from a large manor house to gaze at it. It's a fair prospect. Uh, pretty enough, I grant you. <laughs> oh, it's nothing to Pemberley, I know, but I must settle somewhere. Have I your approval? You'll find society something savage. Country manners? I think they're charming. Then you better take it. Thank you. I shall. I shall close the attorney directly. The two men ride off to the manor. Elizabeth watches them from a hill far away. She begins to walk down the hill but takes a slow turn to look around her before she goes skipping and running down the dirt road. She continues her walk, picking flowers. She walks down the lane towards Longbourn. Lydia, that's mine! It's mine now! You'd never wear it anyway! I would! I wanted to wear it today! Look what you've done to it! Mama! Mama, Lydia has torn up my bonnet, made it up new, and said she will wear it to church. Tell us she shall not, Mama. I shall wear it, Mama. I beg you would tell her so, for it's all my own work, and she would be a fright in it, because she's too plain to look well I... in it. <sighs> no, no, you shall not have it. Mama, tell her it is so. Girls, would you tear my nerves into shreds? Oh, let her have it, Kitty, and be done. But it's mine. You let her have everything that is mine. <sighs> Lydia puts on the bonnet. Kitty wipes her nose as she cries and runs through the front hall, where Jane enters from another room and Elizabeth comes in from outside. Oh, what is to become of us all? Jane? Lizzie, where are you? Here, Mama. Coming, Mama. Mrs. Bennet talks with another woman outside of the church. Mr. Bennet gives her a glance to come along as he and their daughters begin to walk home. Mrs. Bennet rushes to catch up with him. My dear! My dear Mr. Bennet! Wonderful news! Oh, Netherfield Park is let at last! Is it? Yes, it is! Oh, I have just had it from Mrs. Long. And do you not want to know who had taken it? Well, you want to tell me, and I have no objection to hearing it. Why, then, it is taken by a young man of large fortune from the north of England. A single man of large fortune, my dear. <laughs> he came down on Monday in Chase and Four to see the place. His name is Bingley, and he will be in possession by a Michaelmas, and, and, he has... Five thousand a year. Oh. <laughs> oh, Mr. Bennett, what a fine thing for our girls. 
Uh, how so? Um, how can it affect them? Oh, Mr. Bennet, how can you be so tiresome? Well, you must know I'm thinking of his marrying one of them. A single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. Yes, he must. And who better than one of our five girls? <laughs> <laughs> Lydia! What a fine joke if he were to choose me. Or me. <laughs> so that is his design in settling here, to marry one of our daughters. Design? Oh, how can you talk such nonsense? But do you know he may very likely fall in love with one of them? Oh. <laughs> Therefore, you must visit him directly he comes. Visit him? Oh, no, no, I see no occasion to do that. Oh, Mr. Bennett. Go yourself with the girls, or, better still, send them by themselves. By themselves? Aye, for you're as handsome as any of them. Mr. Bingley might like you best of the party. The Bennets enter the house. Mr. Bennett takes off his hat puts down his walking stick and walks off. Hill enters as he exits. Mrs. Bennet enters and Hill helps her remove her coat, while the other girls hand their hats and jackets to another servant. Oh, I'm so distressed! <laughs> For Mr. Bennet says he will not visit Mr. Bingley when he comes. Oh, there, there now, ma'am. I dare say it will turn out to be well. No, no, it will not, for he is bent on ruining us all. <laughs> Mrs. Bennet enters the sitting room and Jane follows, trying to calm her. Mama, I'm sure he's teasing you. He will call on Mr. Bingley as sure as he would call on any new neighbour of ours. Oh, Jane, how can you say that? I mean, you heard him yourself, and you know that your father has a will of iron. You're in the right, my dear, but I'll tell you what I'll do. I shall write to Mr. Bingley, informing him that I have five daughters, and he's welcome to any of them that he chooses. They're all silly and ignorant like the other girls. Well, Lizzie has a little more wit than the rest, but then he may prefer a stupid wife, as others have done before him. There, will that do? No, no, I beg you will not write at all. Oh, oh, you take delight in vexing me. You have no compassion on my poor nerves. Oh, you mistake me, my dear. I have a high respect for your nerves. They've been my old friends these 20 years at least. You don't know what I suffer. Well, I hope you will get over it and live to see many young men of 5,000 a year come into the neighborhood. Oh, it will be no use to us if 20 such should come since you will not visit them. Depend on it, my dear. When there are 20, I'll visit them all. There, do you see Jane? He will not be prevailed upon. He see us all ruined. <laughs> If only we'd been able to have sons! Lydia comes in and slouches into a chair with her hand on her stomach, complaining, Lord, I'm so hungry! Jane brushes her hair in front of the mirror in her room. Jane and Elizabeth are wearing nightgowns. Elizabeth sighs. If I could love a man who would love me enough to take me for a mere £50 a year, I should be very well pleased. Yes. But such a man could hardly be sensible, and you know I could never love a man who was out of his wits. Oh, Lizzie, a marriage where either party cannot love or respect the other, that cannot be agreeable to either party as we have daily proof. But beggars, you know, cannot be choosers. We are not very poor, Lizzie. 
With father's estate entailed away from the female line, we have little but our charms to recommend us. One of us at least will have to marry very well. And since you are quite five times as pretty as the rest of us and have the sweetest disposition, I fear that task will fall on your shoulders to raise our fortunes. Lizzie, I would wish, I should so much like to marry for love. And so you shall. I'm sure. Only take care you fall in love with a man of good fortune. <laughs> well, I shall try to please you. And you? I am determined, but, but nothing but the very deepest love will induce me into matrimony. So I shall end an old maid and teach your ten children to embroider cushions and play their instruments very ill. <laughs> The following day, Mr. Bennett sits in his chair reading the newspaper. Lydia stands while the others sit. Mr. Bingley has come to Netherfield. Sir William Lucas has called on him. Oh, save your breath to call your porridge, Kitty. I will tell Mama. I do not wish to know. What should we care for Mr. Bingley since we are never to be acquainted with but him? Mama. Oh, don't keep coughing so, Kitty. For heaven's sake. Have a little compassion on my nerves. He has for my own amusement. 40 servers, and he's very handsome, and wears a blue coat. And he declared to Sir William that he loves to dance. And he's promised to come to the next ball. At the assembly rooms. On Saturday. And bring six ladies and four gentlemen. Nay, it was 12 ladies and seven gentlemen. Too many ladies. Oh, Lydia, I beg for you all to stop, for we are never to know Mr Bingley, and it pains me to hear of him. Mama, I am sick of Mr. Bingley. I'm sorry to hear that. If I had known as much this morning, I should never have called on him. You have called on him? I'm afraid we cannot escape the acquaintance now. <laughs> oh, my dear Mr. Bennet, how good you are to us. Oh, uh, well, well. Girls, girls, is he not a good father? Oh, and never to tell us. <laughs> oh, what a good joke. Oh, and now you shall dance with Mr. Bingley. <laughs> Mrs. Bennet takes her youngest daughter's hand and they laugh together. Mary does not look pleased and puts her glasses back on to read. I hope he has a strong constitution, Mama. And a fondness for silly young women. <laughs> Two carriages pull up to the Red Lion. Mr. and Mrs. Hurst step out of one carriage and Mr. Bingley steps out of another carriage and puts on a hat. He is followed by Mr. Darcy, who also puts on a hat, and is followed by Caroline Bingley, who sidles up next to Darcy. Shall we be quite safe here, Mr. Darcy, do you think? Damn silly way to spend an evening. Inside, people are dancing and clapping to lively music, including the Bennets. The song finishes, the dancers clap, but everyone goes quiet with whispers when Bingley's party enters. Sir William Lucas sees them and approaches them quickly. Mr Bingley, allow me to the pleasure of welcoming you, welcoming you to our little assembly here. Sir William, I am very glad to see you. There is nothing that I love better than a country dance. Music starts up again. Guests line up for the next dance, and Mr Bingley introduces Sir William to his sisters. Elizabeth rejoins her sisters and friends. Only two ladies then, after all. Do you know who they are, Charlotte? Mr. Bingley's sisters, I understand. One of them is married to the gentleman there, Mr. Hurst. The taller gentleman? No, the other. Better and better. Very elegant. Better pleased with themselves than what they see, I think. Missy! Jane! Come here. Do you see that gentleman there? 
Lady Lucas has just told me he's Mr. Bingley's oldest friend. His name is Darcy. <laughs> and he has a mighty fortune and a great estate in Derbyshire. <laughs> Bingley's wealth is nothing compared to his. 10,000 a year at if he'd be quite so handsome if he was not quite so rich <gasps> oh lizzie oh lord they're coming over smile girls smile mrs bennett mr bingley has expressed a wish to become acquainted with you and your daughters sir that is very good of you <laughs> this is jane my eldest and elizabeth and uh, mary sits over there and Kitty and Lydia, they're my youngest, you see they're dancing. Do you like to dance yourself? There is nothing I have better, madam. Uh, and if Miss Bennet is not otherwise engaged, uh, may I be so bold as to claim the next two dances? I am not engaged, sir. Oh, good, good. You do us great honour, sir. Thank the gentleman, Jay. And you, sir, hmm? are you fond of dancing too? Oh, I beg your pardon. Uh, Mrs. Bennett, may I present to my friend, Mr. Darcy? You are very welcome to Hertfordshire, I am sure, sir. And I hope you have come as eager to dance as your friend has. Thank you, madam. I rarely dance. Well, let this be one of those occasions, sir, for I wager you'll, you'll not easily find such lively music or such pretty partners. Mrs. Bennet indicates Elizabeth. Mr. Darcy bows and walks away. Um, pray, excuse me, Mum. Well, did you ever meet such a proud and disagreeable man? Mama, he will hear you. Oh, I don't care if he does. And his friend disposed to be so agreeable and everything charming. Who does he think himself so far above his company? Well, the very rich can afford to give offence wherever they go. We need not care for his good opinion. No, indeed. Perhaps he is not so very handsome after all. No, indeed. Quite ill-favoured. Certainly nothing at all to Mr Bingley. Bingley dances with Jane and shoots a smile at Darcy to project just how much fun he's having. Darcy smirks in amusement, but then frowns as he catches sight of Mrs. Bennet gossiping about him. Bingley introduces Jane to his sisters. Mrs. Bennet is pleased. The dance finishes. Bingley leads Jane to the Lucas girls and approaches Darcy as the next dance begins. Elizabeth watches them. Come, Darcy, I must have you dance. I must. I hate to see you standing about in this stupid manner. Come, you'd much better dance. I certainly shall not. In an assembly such as this, it would be insupportable. Your sisters are engaged at present. You know perfectly well it would be a punishment for me to stand up with any other woman in the room. Good God, man! I wouldn't be as fastidious as you are for a kingdom. Upon my honour, I have never met so many pleasant girls in my life and several of them uncommonly pretty, eh? <laughs> you have been dancing with the only handsome girl in the room. Oh, Darcy, she is the most beautiful creature I ever beheld. Look, there's one of her sisters. She's very pretty too, I dare say, very agreeable. She is tolerable, I suppose, but not handsome enough to tempt me. <laughs> Bingley, I am in no humour to give consequence to young ladies who are slighted by other men. Go back to your partner, enjoy her smiles, you're wasting your time with me. Bingley leaves as Elizabeth rises from her chair and walks past Darcy, smiling in amusement, to tell Charlotte what happened. Darcy watches Elizabeth as the two women laugh together. Dancing continues. Lord, I'm so fat. 
and Lydia and I danced every dance. And Mary, none. <laughs> and Mr Bingley favoured Jane above every other girl for, well, for he, he danced the first two with her and the next with Charlotte Lucas, which vexed me greatly. But lo, there the very next, nothing would please him more but to stand up with Jane again. And then, you know, he did dance with Lizzie, but then, <laughs> who do you think he danced with next? Enough, enough, madam. For God's sake, let's hear no more of his partners. Would he had sprained his ankle in the first dance? Oh, and his sisters. Oh, such such charming women. But they were so elegant and obliging. Oh, oh, I wish you'd have seen them. And I dare say the lace on Mrs. Hurst's gown. Alone. No lace, no lace, Mrs. Bennet, I beg you. But the man. He brought with him Mr. Darcy, as he calls himself, is not worth our concern. Though he may be the richest man in Derbyshire, the proudest, the most horrid, disagreeable. Do you know, he slighted poor Lizzie, you know, and flatly refused to stand up with her. Slighted my Lizzie, did he? I didn't care for him either, father, so it is of little matter. Well, another time, Lizzie, I would not dance with him if he should ask you. I believe, ma'am, I may safely promise you never to dance with Mr. Darcy. So, none of the Hertfordshire ladies could please you, Mr. Darcy. Not even famous Miss Bennet. Well, I never met with pleasanter people or prettier girls in my life. Bingley, you astonish me. I saw little beauty and no breeding at all. The eldest Miss Bennet is, I grant you, very pretty. A fine concession. Come on, man, admit it, she's an angel. She smiles too much. Oh, Jane Bennet is a sweet girl. <laughs> Her mother. <laughs> I heard Eliza Bennet described as a famous local beauty. What do you say to that, Mr. Darcy? I would as soon call her mother a whip. <laughs> oh, Mr. Darcy, that's too cruel. Darcy, I shall never understand why you go through the world determined to be displeased with everything and everyone in it. And I will never understand why you are in such a rave to approve of everything and everyone that you meet. Well, you shall not make me think ill of Miss Bennet, Darcy. Indeed, he shall not. I shall dare his disapproval and declare she is a dear, sweet girl, despite her unfortunate relations, and I should not be sorry to know her better. No, no, nor I. You see, Mr Darcy, we are not afraid of you. I would not have you so. Ah, ah, what? Damn fine waste of an evening. Yes, what? Well... Jane and Elizabeth pick flowers next to the house the following day. He is just what a young man ought to be, Lizzie. Sensible, lively, and I never saw such happy manners. Handsome too, which a young man ought to be if he possibly can. And he seems to like you very much, which shows good judgment. No? I give you leave to like him. He's like many a stupider person. Dear Lizzie. He could be happier in his choice of sisters and friends, though I suppose the sisters he cannot help. Did you not like them? Not at all. Their manners are quite different from his. At first, perhaps, but after a while, I found them very pleasing. Miss Bingley is to keep house for her brother, and I'm sure they will be very charming neighbours. One of them, maybe. No, Lizzie, I'm sure you're wrong. And even Mr. Darcy, you know, may improve on closer acquaintance. You mean he'll be in humour to give consequence to young ladies who are slighted by other men? Never. <laughs> <laughs> she is tolerable, I suppose, but not handsome enough to tempt me. <laughs> <sighs> it was very wrong of him to speak so. Ah, indeed it was. Capital offence. Oh, look, Charlotte has come. Charlotte. Lizzie, my father is to give a party at Lucas Lodge, and you're all invited. Mm. 
Mary plays piano at the party. Sir William Lucas talks with Bingley's sisters. I hope this will be the first of many occasions when Lucas Lodge will be graced with your presence. Here, you see, we are all easy with no awkwardness of ceremony. Quite. Across the room, Mrs. Bennet talks with Colonel Forster and Mrs. Forster. And are you pleased with Hertfordshire, Colonel Forster? Very much so, Mrs. Bennet, and never more so than this evening. The regiment of infantry doesn't find a ready welcome everywhere, I fear. Well, I think the officers will be very pleased with Meryton, sir. <laughs> Jenny and Sanderson seem well pleased already. No doubt you attend assemblies at St. James's Court, Miss Bingley. We go, but rarely, sir. Indeed. I am surprised. I should be happy to introduce you there. You know, at any time when I'm in town. You're too kind, sir. Miss Bingley and Mrs. Hurst curtsy stiffly. Sir William bows and the sisters walk away. Well, well, good. Capital. Capital. Operable conceit to imagine that we'd need his assistance in society. I'm sure he's a very good sort of man, Caroline. <laughs> and I'm sure he kept a very good sort of shop before his elevation to the knighthood. <laughs> <laughs> oh, poor Darcy, what agonies he must be suffering. Music, conversation and laughter continue throughout the room. Elizabeth notices Darcy staring at her and looks away. Are you in Meryton to subdue the discontented populace, sir, or do you defend Hertfordshire against the French? <laughs> Neither, my first. We hope to winter very peacefully at Meryton. My soldiers are in great need of training, and my officers in ever great need of society. Then, as soon as you are settled, I hope you will give a ball. Oh, yes, my dear, please do. You think a ball would be well received? A ball? Who's giving a ball? Oh, I long for a ball, and so does Denny. Sanderson, don't you, Sanderson? Oh, I do indeed, most passionately. Oh, little Sanderson, I knew you would. Make him give a ball, Mrs. Forster. We'll dance with all the officers. If Mary would only play something, we could dance with them now. Mary, Mary, let's have no more of that dull stuff. Play something jolly. We want to dance. But there are still two movements. Mama, tell them it isn't fair. Oh. Play a jig, Mary. Nobody wants a concertos here. I fear their taste is not as fine as yours and mine, Mary, but let us oblige them this once, eh? For there is no one here who plays as well as you. Very well, though you know it gives me little pleasure. Jane, Mr Bingley, come and dance with us. Not now. Oh. Capital! Capital! I see that Mr Bingley continues, continues his attentions to Jane, Lizzie. I'm very happy for her, Charlotte. She does seem very well pleased with him. I think if he continues so, she is in a fair way to be very much in love with him. And Mr Bingley, do you think he is in love? It is clear that he likes her very much. Well then, she should leave him in no doubt of her heart. She should show more affection even than she feels, not less, if she is to secure him. Secure him, Charlotte? Well, yes, she should secure him in as soon as may be. Before she is sure of his character, before she is even certain of her own regard for him. But of course, happiness in marriage is entirely a matter of chance, you know. There will always be vexation and grief, and it is better to know in advance as little as possible of the defects of your marriage partner. Charlotte? Is it not now? You know it is not sound. You would never act like that yourself. Well, it seems that Jane will not, so we must hope that Mr Bingley will. I think he gets little encouragement from his sisters. Or his friend. Charlotte and Elizabeth look at Darcy, and Darcy notices. Charlotte looks back and forth between Darcy and Elizabeth. Mr Darcy looks at you a great deal, Lizzie. I cannot think why, unless he means to frighten me with his contempt. I wish he would not come into society. He only makes people uneasy. <laughs> <laughs> One.
What a charming amusement for young people this is, Mr. Darcy. Nothing like dancing, you know. One of the refinements of every polished society. And every unpolished society. Sir? Every savage can dance. Oh, yes, yes, quite. Elizabeth passes Sir William. Capital, capital. Ah, Miss Eliza, why are you not dancing? Mr. Darcy, allow me to present this young lady to you as a very desirable partner. You cannot refuse to dance, I'm sure, when so much beauty is before you. Indeed, sir. I have not the least intention of dancing. Please, don't suppose that I move this way in order to beg a partner. I would be very happy if you would do me the honour of dancing with me, Miss Bennet. Thank you, but, um, excuse me, I, I am not inclined to dance. Come, come, why not? When you see Mr Darcy has no objection, although he dislikes the amusement so much in general. Oh, Mr Darcy is all politeness. He is, he is, and why should he not be, considering the inducement, for who could object to such a part eh, Darcy? I beg you would excuse me. Elizabeth curtsies and leaves. Darcy bows and watches her walk away. Well, well, oh, capital, Lydia, capital. Sir William laughs and walks to another part of the room. Miss Bingley approaches Darcy. I believe I can guess your thoughts at this moment. I should imagine not. <laughs> you are thinking how insupportable it would be to spend many evenings in such tedious company. Now, indeed, my mind was more agreeably engaged. I have been meditating on the very great pleasure which a pair of fine eyes and the face of a pretty woman would And I wonder, ask, whose are the eyes that inspired these reflections? Miss Elizabeth Bennet. Miss e Elizabeth Bennet? I am all astonishment. Darcy gazes at Elizabeth. The following day, the Bennet family sits down to breakfast. A letter has just arrived for Jane. The field? Oh, Jane! Well, what does it say? It is from oh. Miss Bingley. Oh, well. Oh, well, that is a good sign, too. Give it to me. My dear friend. Ooh. <laughs> there now. Dine with Louisa and me. Hmm. La -di da la -di da As the gentlemen are to dine with the officers. Oh, well, that's unlucky. But still, still, you must go and make of it what you can. Yours ever, Caroline Bindley. Oh, oh, what beautiful and elegant hand. May I have the carriage, Father? The carriage? No, indeed. You must go on horseback, for it looks like rain. Then you'll have to stay the night. Mother! Well, why do you look at me like that? Would you go all the way to Netherfield and back without seeing Mr Bingley? No, indeed. You will go on Nelly. That will do very well, indeed. Jane rides through the pouring rain. Later, Jane dines with the Bingley sisters, with a blanket wrapped around her shoulders. Now, let me see if I've got this right, Jane. Your mother's sister is named Mrs Phillips? Yes. Uh, and Mr Phillips' estate is... Um... Um, he lives in Meryton. Uh, he's an attorney. And your mother's brother lives in London? Yes, in Gracechurch Street. Which part of London is Gracechurch Street, Jane? I, um, forgive me, I... I force it, get help. Miss Bennet is unwell. The Bennets eat breakfast, minus Jane. 
Well, my dear, if Jane should die of this fever, it will be comfort to know that it was all in pursuit of Mr. Bingley and under your orders. Oh, nonsense! People do not die of little trifling colds. She will be very well taken care of. Mama, I think I must go to Netherfield. Go to Netherfield? No. No, no, there's no call for that. Jane is very well where she is, and you know that there's nothing for you in Netherfield. You'd much better go to Meryton with your sisters and meet the officers. Aye, Lizzie, for there are more than enough to go around. I know that Jane would wish me to be with her. I suppose that is a hint for me to send for the carriage. Oh, no, indeed, Father, for I had much rather walk. It is barely three miles to Netherfield, and I'll be back for dinner. Walk three miles in all that dirt? Well, you'll not be fit to be seen. Well, I shall be fit to see Jane, which is all I want. I'm quite determined, Mother. No, Lizzie. Lizzie and I will set you as far as Meryton. <gasps> Aye, let's call on Denny early, before he is dressed. What a shock he will get. <laughs> <laughs> Our life holds few distinctions, Mrs. Bennet, but I think we may safely boast that here sit two of the silliest girls in the country. Elizabeth climbs over a stile and hops into a patch of mud. She wipes her feet as best she can, gives up and continues walking. She walks around a tree in sight of Netherfield and meets Darcy, who happens to be strolling her way. Darcy is startled. Miss Bennet. Mr. Darcy, I'm come to inquire after my sister. On foot. As you see, would you be so kind as to take me to her? Amused, Darcy motions for her to join him, walking back to the house. Later, the Bingleys and the Hearst are sitting down to eat. Darcy stands drinking tea. Well, we must allow her to be an excellent walker, I suppose, but her appearance this morning, she really looked almost wild. I could hardly keep my countenance. What does she mean by scampering about the country because her sister has a cold? <laughs> her hair, Louisa! <laughs> well, her petticoat. I hope you saw her petticoat, brother. Six inches deep in mud, I'm absolutely certain. I must confess it quite escaped my notice. I thought she looked remarkably well. You observed it, I'm sure, Mr Darcy. I did. I'm inclined to think you wouldn't wish your sister to make such an exhibition. Certainly not. It seems to me to show an abominable sort of conceited independence. Hmm? It shows an affection for her sister that is very pleasing. I'm afraid, Mr. Darcy, that this escapade may have affected your admiration for her fine eyes. Not at all. They were brightened by the exercise. But Jane Bennett is a sweet girl. It's very sad she should have such an unfortunate family, such low connections. Her uncle, she told us, is in trade and lives in Cheapside. Well, perhaps we should call when we are next in town. <laughs> <laughs> they would be just as agreeable to me had the uncles enough to fill all Cheapside. With such connections, they can have very little chance of marrying well, Bingley. That is the material point. A door opens and Elizabeth enters. Mr Bingley stands and faces her. Miss Bennet, how does your sister do? Is she any better? I am afraid that she is quite unwell, Mr Bingley. Let me send for Mr Jones, and you must stay until your sister is recovered. Oh, I would not wish to inconvenience you. Oh, I wouldn't hear of anything else. I'll send to Longburn for your clothes directly. You're very kind, sir. Bingley turns to a servant who bows and sets off. Is there any sport today, or not? Later, Elizabeth finishes dressing for the evening and turns to Jane. There. Shall I disgrace you, do you think? You look very pretty, Lizzie, as you are well aware. Oh, Jane, I would much rather stay here with you. The superior sisters wish me miles away. Only your Mr Bingley is civil and attentive. He's not my Mr Bingley, Lizzie. Oh, I think he is, or he very soon will be.
Elizabeth sits on a love seat reading as the Bingleys and hosts play cards. Mr. Darcy enters. Mr. Darcy, come and advise me, for Mr. Hurst carries all before him. Ha! Oh. Mr. Darcy approaches Elizabeth. May I inquire after your sister, Miss Bennet? I thank you. Um, she is a little better. I'm very glad to hear it. Oh, Mr. Hurst, I'm quite undone. He should have played the deuce. He has undone us all, Mr. Darcy. Will you join us, Miss Bennet? Uh, no, thank you. You, refer, you prefer reading to cards, do you? Singular. Miss Bennet despises cards. She is a great reader and has no pleasure in else. <laughs> well, I deserve neither such praise nor such censure. I'm not a great reader and I take pleasure in many things. And what do you do so secretly, sir? No secret. I'm writing to my sister. Oh, dear Georgiana. Oh, how I long to see her. Is she much grown since the spring? Is she as tall as me? <laughs> She's now about Miss Elizabeth Bennet's height, or a little taller. Oh, and so accomplished. Her performance at the piano forte is exquisite. Do you play, Miss Bennet? Aye, but very ill indeed. But all young ladies are accomplished. They sing, they draw, they dance, speak French, German, cover screens, I know not what. There are not half a dozen who would satisfy my notion of an accomplished woman. Oh, certainly. No woman can be really deemed as accomplished who does not also possess a certain something in her air, in the manner of walking, in the tone of her voice, her address and expressions. And to all this, she must yet add something more substantial in the improvement of her mind by extensive reading. I am no longer surprised at you knowing only six accomplished women, Darcy. I rather wonder at you knowing any. Darcy puts down his pen and faces Elizabeth. You are very severe upon your sex, Miss Bennet. I must speak as I find. Perhaps you have not had the advantage, Miss Bennet, of moving in society enough. There are many very accomplished young ladies amongst our acquaintance. Come, come, this is a fine way to play cards. You're all light. <sighs> the following day, Miss Bingley closes the door quietly as she enters the drawing room. And now the mother. Are we to be invaded by every Bennet in the country? God, it's too much to be born. Oh, Lord. The Bennet troop enters. Mr. Bingley stands and hurries to face them. Uh, Mrs. Bennet, you are very welcome. I hope you do not find Miss Bennet worse than you expected. Indeed, I do, sir. She is very ill indeed and suffers a vast deal, though with the greatest patience in the world, for she has the sweetest temper, <laughs> Mr. Bingley, but she is a great deal too ill to be moved. We must trespass a little longer on your kindness. But, but of course. Then it will receive every possible attention, ma'am, I assure you. You are very good. Ah, oh, well, you have a sweet room here. <laughs> I think you will never want to leave Never Neverfield now you are come here. No, I believe I should be happy to live in the country forever. Wouldn't you, Darcy? You would. You know, I find the society somewhat confined and unvarying for your taste. Confined and unvarying? Indeed it is not, sir. The, the country is a vast deal pleasanter to pleasanter than town, whatever you may say about it. Mama, you mistake Mr. Darcy's meaning. Oh, do I? Do I? He seems to think the country nothing at all. Mama. Can find unvarying. I would have a no we dine with four and twenty families. <laughs> uh, Mama, uh, have you seen Charlotte Lucas since I came away? <sighs> yes. She called yesterday with Sir William. Oh, what an agreeable man he is. That is my idea of good breeding. And those persons who fancy themselves very important and never open their mouths quite mistake the matter. Hmm. Um, Mr Bingley, did you not promise to give a ball at Netherfield as soon as you were settled here? 
It will be a great scandal if you don't keep your word. I am perfectly ready to keep my engagement. And when your sister is recovered, you shall name the day of the ball, uh, if you please. Oh. <laughs> Lydia, now that's a fair promise for you. That's generosity for you. That's what I call gentlemanly behaviour. That evening, Mr. Hurst is passed out on a couch, while the rest of the group occupy themselves. Darcy and Elizabeth read. Miss Bingley pretends to read as she walks around the room. Mrs. Hurst sits in a chair and Bingley stands by the fire. Miss Bingley puts down the book and tries to catch Darcy's attention by leaning over his. She fails and strolls over to Elizabeth. Bingley sits down. Miss Eliza Bennet. Let me persuade you to follow my example and take a turn about the room. It's so refreshing. Miss Bingley glances over her shoulder at Darcy. Elizabeth closes her books and stands up and begins to walk arm in arm with Miss Bingley. Will you not join us, Mr. Darcy? I will defeat the object. Well, what do you mean, sir? What on earth can he mean? I think we would do better not to inquire. Nay, we insist on knowing your meaning, sir that your figures appear to best advantage when walking and that I might best admire them from my present position. <laughs> Shocking! Abominable reply! How shall we punish him, Miss Eliza? <laughs> Nothing so easy. Tease him. Laugh at him. Laugh at Mr Darcy? Impossible! He is a man without fault. Is he indeed? A man without fault? It is not possible for anyone. But it has been my study to avoid those weaknesses which expose a strong understanding to ridicule. Oh, such as um, vanity, perhaps? Mm, um, pride? Yes, vanity is a weakness indeed. But pride? Well, where there is real superiority of mind, pride will always be under good regulation. I have faults enough, Miss Bennet, but I hope they are not of understanding. My temper I cannot vouch for, it might be called resentful. My good opinion, once lost, is lost forever. That is a failing indeed, but I cannot laugh at it. I believe every disposition has a tendency to some particular evil. Your defect is a propensity to hate everyone. While yours is to willfully misunderstand them. Uh, shall we have some music? Hmm? The following day, Elizabeth and Jane wait to depart. Give your parents my warmest salutations and tell your father he's most welcome to come shooting with us any time convenient. Thank you, sir. You are very kind. Goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, Jane, I'm sorry to say it, but notwithstanding your excellent Mr. Bingley, I have never been so happy to leave a place in my life. 